This video is sponsored by Skillshare. Despite my near vampire-like insistence on avoiding the sun, I am nevertheless a pretty dark-skinned chocolate boy. Fortunately, I like how I look. I think I'm pretty sexy. But growing up, I was always cognizant of an underlying tension between black people who were light-skinned, or as we used to say, light-skinned, and dark-skinned people like me. Now, sometimes this was just played for jokes and common schoolyard teasing, so it was hard to differentiate it from any other kind of mocking, because kids in middle school were fucking monsters. Yo Mama So Black was a standard opener in our array of Yo Mama jokes. For example, Yo Mama So Black, she went to night school and got marked absent. But something I definitely definitely noticed as a lonely and arguably girl-obsessed dark-skinned teenager is that the lighter skin toned boys were definitely more successful romantically than I and my other dark-skinned brothers were. Maybe they were just cooler, more stylish, and more charismatic. It's definitely possible. I was a huge dork in middle and high school. But I mean, so was everybody else. Whether or not that was the issue, the fact that darker skinned people were treated differently than lighter skinned people became more and more evident to me as I grew up and ventured out into the world. It was uncommon, for example, to have a dark-skinned black person as your server in a restaurant or your associate in a department store. When you could find a doll or an action figure that represented a black person, they didn't usually have very dark skin, especially the ones that were targeted towards girls. It was also rare to see a dark-skinned person as the lead on a movie or a TV show. You often couldn't create characters in video games with very dark skin. Skin. Look at this, look at all the options they have for making a white dude. There's one, arguably two black dudes, and he's nowhere near enough of a chocolate boy. And don't even get me started on these hairstyles. Well, obviously that's the one. And while we've made improvements, a lot of this still applies today. As it turns out, these are all examples of what we now refer to as colorism. Hi, I'm T1J. Follow me. Colorism is a type of discrimination that's a step beyond racism, where people are marginalized not merely because of their race, but because of the literal tone of their skin. The coining of the term is widely attributed to author Alice Walker, who ironically seems to have some issues with racism herself, go figure, but that's beyond the scope of this video. It's when people are treated differently for having darker or lighter skin, even when they are the same race. And often that discrimination comes from people of that same race. Now I'm most familiar with colorism as it relates to black Americans, but societies all over the world have historically held prejudices against people with darker skin. And just like with racism, this discrimination causes people with lighter skin tones to experience a measure of privilege, even if they are a member of a disadvantaged group. And many of those privileges mirror the advantages that white people have over other racial groups. There's data to back this up. Dark skinned people report more frequent microaggressions than lighter skinned people. There's an actual wage gap between dark and light-skinned people. Light-skinned black people receive more lenient prison sentences. People with light skin are perceived as more intelligent and more attractive, which I don't get at all. Have you seen this face? And the list goes on. Negative perceptions of people with darker skin goes all the way back to ancient times. It most likely originated with the fact that nobility and other upper class people were able to stay indoors, while the poor and the lower class labored outside in the sun, resulting in their skin appearing darker. So in many cultures, darker skin became associated with poverty and squalor, and over time evolved to just become undesirable and unattractive. This is especially the case for women who, just like today, were pressure to live up to sometimes unrealistic standards of beauty. And many women at the time perceived lighter skin as more feminine and more beautiful, which is a concept that hasn't really gone away. The global market for products that supposedly whiten the skin, even ones that are potentially harmful, is somewhere in the realm of 20 billion US dollars. 100% natural orange papaya extracts water on skin, whiter and smoother feeling in one week. White plus papaya, my skin so white. <laughs> These discriminatory attitudes based on ancient classism were further reinforced as a result of European colonialism. As the influence of Western culture has spread throughout the world, so has the association of beauty and wealth with whiteness, and subsequently lighter skin, which has only made the ancient problem of colorism that much more damaging. 
The effects of European colonialism on the attitudes about skin color perhaps emerged most prominently during the transatlantic slave trade. The race-based prejudice that Europeans used to justify their domination and enslavement of people of indigenous and African descent was further used to divide members of those groups. For example, people who were conceived through a sexual union between a black person and a white person, often a result of rape, naturally ended up having lighter skin and were usually treated less harshly and given less strenuous tasks than other slaves. One of the most well-known Known examples of this is the fact that lighter skinned slaves were often allowed to work indoors while the darker ones worked in harsher conditions outside in the fields. Because of these advantages, light skinned black people had a better chance of becoming educated or skilled, having wealth or property, or even being freed from slavery. And this was no doubt a tool used by Europeans to encourage an association of whiteness with worth and value. So even if you weren't fully white, the closer you were, the better. Unfortunately, this led to a legacy of tension between lighter skinned black people and darker skinned black people even after slavery was abolished. In many parts of the United States, the one drop rule came into effect, which classified anyone with any shred of African ancestry as legally black and thus unequal to whites. Nevertheless, some light skinned people actually came up believing that having more European ancestry made them superior to people with darker skin. Or at the very least, many of them took it advantage of the privileges afforded them even if they were still seen as second-class citizens by white society. Yes, you can be privileged and disadvantaged at the same time. A lot of y'all act like y'all don't understand that. This is an important lesson about power and privilege. Those with power, no matter how little, are regularly driven to maintain that power, whether consciously or not, and sometimes even at the cost of their own allies. Light-skinned black people in America even formed exclusive clubs and fraternities. In the early 1900s, some black neighborhoods would host so-called paper bag parties, where if your skin was darker than the color of a brown paper bag, you weren't allowed in. I don't think I would have made it in. These sorts of tests weren't limited to informal house parties though. Even black institutions like churches and universities would select members based on skin tone. And people have asserted that some of them even used the paper bag test themselves. This led to not only increasing friction between people of different skin tones, but it also led to a measurable gap in areas such as income, education, and even romantic desirability. And just like in other parts of the world, colorism affects women in a very specific and arguable arguably more damaging way. Dark-skinned women experience all the same negative outcomes as everybody else, but they have to deal with the added pressure of society expecting them to uphold Eurocentric standards of beauty. I talked about how the light-skinned boys at school had an easier time gaining romantic attention, but in truth, it was the same for the lighter-skinned girls as well. But this ends up affecting women in a deeper way. As I pointed out in my video about racial dating preferences, black women usually rank near the bottom on opinion surveys measuring general attractiveness and desirability. As you might imagine, this problem is confounded for black women with darker skin. Now, whether or not people find you physically attractive may seem frivolous, but it's no coincidence that many of the benefits that you get when people find you attractive can be directly compared to the benefits people get for being white. These benefits include things like being perceived as more approachable, being perceived as smarter, healthier, more persuasive, or more trustworthy. All of which, of course, can lead to positive outcomes in many areas, such as getting a job or interacting with law enforcement. And as always, we can look to our popular media for insight about what is perceived as beautiful or worthy of attention. My name is Kim, this light-skinned girl from Shaolin. And as for them pretty light-skinned models standing in the cold. light skin from the Skin girl with the curly hair. With only a few exceptions, the majority of the world's most successful and iconic non-white female musical artists are women with lighter skin tones. The majority of the most successful actresses of color have skin on the lighter end of the spectrum. On TV shows and movies featuring black performers throughout the years, it was common for the female lead to be women with light skin. And dark skinned women were often cast as the crazy or feisty friend of the main character. Incidentally, these darker skinned women were commonly depicted as having trouble in their love lives. As I said, I'm most familiar with colorism when it relates to the plight of black people. But other cultures experience colorism in different ways. 
exists, especially throughout the various regions in Asia. The association of lighter skin with beauty and class still persists and has been made worse by the increasing influence of Eurocentric standards. The Bollywood films that are popular in South Asia often feature lighter skin performers, which doesn't always accurately reflect the population in that area. I read an article about a woman in China who was literally scolded on the streets because she wasn't holding an umbrella to protect her fair skin from the sun. And this problem is even more complex for Asian people living in Western countries. The idea of skin tone as a status symbol on top of the European legacy of racism leads to problems that mirror the issues that other people of color experience. The half Chinese actor and singer Chloe Bennett was born Chloe Wong but had to change her name before she could get a job in Hollywood. And it's common for people of color to change their name to something more palatable to white people in order to gain favor in various ways. Luckily, I have a super generic name, so I often have the pleasure of watching white people pretend not to be surprised when they meet me for the first time. And this of course reminds me of the famous study that showed that people with black sounding names were less likely to get called back for job interviews. But what happens at the end of the day is the same result. Whiteness is upheld as the ideal, while blackness is disparaged as inferior. And this is not meant to drag any of the people I mentioned or any light-skinned people in general. I encourage people of all complexions to thrive and do everything you can to achieve your goals and dreams, while we work together to dismantle systems of oppression. Sometimes I see people accusing light-skinned people or mixed heritage people of being not fully committed to the cause or even not black enough or not Asian enough. And I wanna be clear that that's not what I'm doing here because that sucks, but colorism is a real thing. And it's something that people are often hesitant to address, especially when it comes from within our own communities. When you are constantly subjected to tangible marginalization as a person of color, especially as a woman of color, it can be difficult to recognize the areas in which you enjoy privilege. Interestingly, there's one instance where this preference for lighter skin may be somewhat subverted, white people. One analysis of over 2,000 advertising photos suggested that white men with darker complexions were thought of as more attractive than their light-skinned counterparts. And while fair-skinned white women still reign supreme, the darker-skinned women were more likely to be depicted with less clothing or in more provocative poses, indicating an association with sexual attractiveness. There's also the common practice of cosmetic tanning, which has been popular among white people for decades. Although it did see an unfortunate dip into the uncanny valley during the popularity of the Jersey Shore. This is interesting to me because, as I mentioned, people of color are consistently rated as less attractive than white people, with the exception of Asian women. And as I said, Asian countries have their own problems with colorism, but I suspect that's a whole nother conversation about Western fetishizing of Asian women. We can talk about that another time. So it seems like white people value a little color, but not so much that they can't retreat back into their whiteness when needed. I don't want to discount the progress we've made in this area. Attitudes are shifting slowly but surely. We're seeing more representation and more cooperation. Although we have internalized a lot of these negative stereotypes, we're having this conversation together and working to solve the problem. But ultimately, colorism is yet another consequence of the legacy of classism and white supremacy. As long as the underlying premise that whiteness equals beauty, intelligence, and wealth exists, these issues will continue to pose problems for everyone else trying to make it in the world. So the solution, in my opinion, is not to attack individuals, but to work together to expose and eradicate the systems and the attitudes that we as individuals have internalized. But that's just me though. What do you think? Thanks for watching that. And thanks to Skillshare for sponsoring this video. Skillshare is an online community for creative types like me and probably most of you. With more than 25,000 classes to choose from, it's a place where you can hone your skills or even learn new ones. The classes cover every category you could ask for, everything from business, design, visual art, photography, film, and even lessons on productivity. 
I know from all the cool fan art I've received over the years that a lot of you are interested in drawing and illustration. So I recommend checking out this class on ink drawing techniques by the award-winning illustrator Yuko Shimizu. It's a great class for both beginners and advanced illustrators. A premium membership to Skillshare will get you unlimited access to thousands of high quality classes just like that one. But if you want to try it out, I have been graciously allowed to hook up my viewers with two months of Skillshare for free. That's two months of unlimited access access to over 25,000 classes for free. To sign up, simply visit the link in the description and start learning today. And remember, by supporting sponsors like Skillshare, you not only get access to a great service, but you also support me and help me take my content to the next level.